So we're going to scale up a little bit now. Um, Gail Brightwell is our next speaker. She's a team leader and also Associate Director of the Food Safety... Zealand Food Safety Science and Research Centre. Excellent. Thank you, Gail. Uh, so she's going to be talking about um, the impacts of climate change on food safety. Thank you and um, good afternoon. So this is actually kind of more recent work. So some of the stuff that you've heard over the afternoon has been over a number of years. Um, and it's part of MPI Schlemack program. And what we wanted to do was to actually engage with industry, all the different food sectors, as well as um, producers, and try and understand what might be the impacts of climate change on food systems. So when we looked at the literature, we saw that there isn't really much work been done on food safety systems within New Zealand. In fact, that's probably reflective worldwide. So some of the things that we wanted to think about was a value chain approach, so all the way from supplier or even the pasture to the consumer but and how that might be impacted whether it's greater cooling needs because the temperature is warmer and we need to be able to move product not only domestically but overseas uh, and that also requires more energy also what would be the implications around food spoilage if it was a warmer or wetter climate in areas, and what could be some of the food safety implications. So we tried to kind of gather some of our thoughts around what the potential impacts of climate change might be on both food quality and safety along the value chain. So I said before, we were looking all the way from the supplier to the consumer. So some of those things might be actually changes in time and length of season. So this could have, say, major impact for growing crops or cereals. Other things we were thinking about was also the changes in product productivity and how vulnerable some of the produ production systems might be. With talking to industry, one of the things that they were struggling to cope with more from a logistic point of view is actually extreme weather events, particularly flooding, and how they actually get their product from A to B, but also from how contaminated that product might be by the time that it gets to the processor, and what they need to be able to do to be able to control that potential increase in both microbial contamination, but also maybe in agricultural pesticides or residues. Also thinking about what could the changes actually be in the nutritional value of our products? And this would be a particular concern for dairy and infant formula type products. And then thinking more around what the food safety implications may be if you've got more or potentially more contaminated product coming into your processing plant or even uh, practice on farm, you might get more regulatory controls, increased testing and surveillance, and that would increase the cost of compliance. Also, there might be new hazards, chemical, biological, physical, and there'll be increased costs associated with controlling these within the, the food value chain. And again, as I mentioned before, if it's going to be a warmer climate, there might be more costs around maintaining the cold chain, and that will be implicated in your potential shelf life if it's a chilled product, but also maintaining your food safety controls around keeping product cold. So I said before it was part of MPI's Schlemack uh, program, and being scientists, we came up with a hypothesis. So as ours was climate change is likely to negatively impact on New Zealand food systems. Equally, we could have said it could positively impact on New Zealand food systems. So we decided also to look at probably the most, I suppose, worst case scenario under RCP85, a high carbon world. What would that look like for implications for food systems and over a mid 
to longer term scenarios into the future. And as I said before, the scope include from farm to retail. So this particular project came under the umbrella of the Food Safety Centre and the partners involved was Ag Research, ESR, NIWA and Massey University. And I also want to thank the many, many industry people that also contributed to this project. So what did we do? So we carried out a series of workshops for engagement, because what we really wanted to learn was from the people that were involved in the production and processing of food. We wanted to learn about what they thought were the impacts that for climate change was going to be on their business. So that was kind of the major part of workshop one. Workshop two, we collated that information and then took it back to them to think about, was it really true? Did they really think that? And what would a potential adaptation look like? The third workshop, we actually went out face to face to talk to many of those industry uh, farmer people that um, we hadn't been able to engage with in the past. Um, so using this information, we decided to develop some fact sheets. So these fact sheets are for discussion and they just kind of capture some of the outcomes that we found through those workshops. And I'll take you through what one of these fact sheets and risk matrices look like in a minute. But we also included some other food safety issues such as antimicrobial resistance and biological control agents because these will also potentially impacted by changes in climate. So if you want to go and have a look at the final report, it's on MPI's Schlamack website. As I said, we went to talk to many different food sectors as we possibly could, and there's a list of them down the side there. And the approach we took around developing the risk matrices was that we wanted to look at both direct and indirect possibilities. So when I'm talking about direct, that means the effect that climate change itself has on a system. So that could be an uh, increase or decrease in an infectious agent or a toxin. When I'm talking about indirect, it's really about the human intervention to control those hazards. So, and that could be management on farm or different processing um, technologies, but also how we handle residues and use of antibiotics and things like this. So an example of a direct one may be that facial eczema may increase because of more humid conditions, but then treatment of that is usually with zinc. The indirect one is that in the EU and other parts of the world, zinc is actually being considered now as an agent that might cause antimicrobial resistance because it's a heavy metal. So there needs to be some thinking about what happens along the whole value chain or supply chain and how that impacts on the food, the export quality and the regulatory environment. So we looked at a number of different, um, I suppose, impacts that the industry people came up with and then kind of came up with a traffic light approach. And we looked at now and in the midterm and later on at 2100. And if things were good, it was green. If there was some impact, yellow, further impact, orange, and then red. And we did this for both kind of the North or South uh, Island regions and how that might impact on that. But we thought there's no point just kind of thinking about what the impacts might be. We also need to think about what potential adaptations may be. So we also put these into the risk matrices. And again, how would they work on the impact on climate change? Would it help or would it just actually maintain where it is? So I so said we have these risk matrices for all of these different um, food sectors and I'm happy to share them if anyone should be interested. Thank you.